Hey everyone, hope you're having a good Thanksgiving and thanks for making some time to watch. There wasn't much headline Artemis news during a short week, but NASA is catching up with visual documentation of events that happened during the government shutdown. There's a lot of focus on Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 right now, and we learned that the last piece of Artemis 3 SLS hardware made progress towards completion during the news blackout in October and much of November. There's more to think about with the prospect that an Artemis 3 lunar landing might be three years away rather than 18 months away, and it brings Artemis 4 farther into the mix. Artemis 2 is first and might be as soon as February. If that mission is clean, NASA may soon have choices to make about what they can do for the rest of the decade. The second lunar landing race with China is what Washington is talking about, but three years from now, the decade will be almost over. The availability of the Orion and SLS hardware assigned to Artemis 4 could be a big factor in whether NASA can fly once or more after Artemis 2 for the rest of the decade. It was a holiday week, and so there was no further news on the status of Artemis 2 launch preparations. The big question mark was whether or not NASA still had time to complete preparations of the flight hardware in particular in time for the launch opportunity at the beginning of February. At the end of the previous week, on Friday, November 21st, the Artemis 2 crew posted on Instagram. Commander Reed Weissman said that the countdown demonstration test had been scheduled for that week, but had been postponed until December. He also said that the CDDT delay won't affect the schedule, but of course out here we're all keen to better understand what impact the change in the CDDT schedule means and how much margin remains. It's possible for both things to be true if the CDDT is not in the critical path for the final launch preparations being made in the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center by Exploration Ground Systems and Launch Processing Prime Contractor Amentum. We don't know if that's the case or not, but EGS may be continuing to press ahead with other work to allow everything to be ready to roll out to the pad in time for the February launch opportunity. Hopefully we will get an update in December before too long. In order to make the February opportunity, launch period 17, the Artemis 2 vehicle and mobile launcher would need to roll out to launch pad 39B in the middle of January to allow for a little more than two weeks worth of countdown preparations at the pad, a wet dress rehearsal tanking test, and the two day long launch countdown itself. As I've noted in a few videos throughout the year, some of the work to get ready to roll out can't be done early because it involves installation or activation of life-limited items. One example is the flight batteries, which have a fixed amount of time they are good for launch before they would need to be replaced with a fresh set. Work like that has to wait until the appropriate time. Mid-January is only about six weeks away now. We aren't that far away, which is why the question of which launch period NASA will target is growing in prominence. During the holiday week, NASA Public Affairs did publish a set of edited videos from activities that occurred during the news blackout in effect for pretty much the entire six-week-long U.S. government shutdown. Acting NASA Administrator, Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy, did post a couple of updates and pictures confirming that the Artemis II Orion spacecraft was stacked on the SLS rocket back in mid-October. Now that the shutdown and news blackout are over, more extensive imagery of those activities are being published on the Agency Video Audio Image Library, or AVAIL, at images.nasa.gov. That included video of the move of Orion from the Launch Abort System facility to the Vehicle Assembly Building on the night of October 16th. Actually, on the front of that edited video was a time-lapse of the Orion stage adapter lift in late September from the VAB transfer aisle into High Bay 3, and then the mate to the top of the SLS in-space second stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. That occurred right before the lapse in funding, which prevented any raw footage from being processed, reviewed, or published in October and the first half of November. Additional edited video was published early this past week of the Orion lift from High Bay 4 up and over the transfer aisle into High Bay 3, and then lowering that down on top of the OSA for mating to SLS. Orion's lift mate was performed on October 18th. And another video was published of footage taken on October 22nd or thereabouts after Orion was hard mated to SLS. 
most of the close-up shots were taken on or around platforms A, B, and C. Platform A provides access to the launch abort system motors, the abort motor, the attitude control motor, and the jettison motor. We see a wide shot from around the vehicle at that level, providing views of Platform A and Platform B. The latter provides access to Orion, the crew access arm, and the Orion service module umbilical. There are more shots on Platform A, and then we see shots from on and around Platform C, which provides access to the mating surface between the SLS ICPS and Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter, or LVSA. Again, this footage was taken over a month ago in mid to late October. Speaking of critical path work, some of the scaffolding we see around Orion, ICPS, and the LVSA might be for work that EGS and Amenum could get ahead of while waiting for the countdown demonstration test to be attempted and completed. On Tuesday, November 25th, NASA Public Affairs published a set of pictures of the Core Stage 3 forward join at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans East. That stacks the top three elements of the stage, the inner tank first, then the liquid oxygen tank, and then the forward skirt. These pictures, which were taken on November 7th, show the breakover, lift, and mate of the LOX tank with the inner tank in one of the integration or stacking cells at MAF. That, and the setup of the inner tank before that, occurred during the six-plus week-long government shutdown, so we're learning that somewhere during the news blackout, all three of those stage elements reached the point where they were ready to stack. The other element that remains in New Orleans, the liquid hydrogen tank, was previously stacked by Core Stage Prime Contractor Boeing with a simulator structure for the engine section that will facilitate transportation of the upper four-fifths of the stage to Kennedy Space Center next year. In between now and then, that aft join of the LH-2 tank and simulator will itself be mated to the forward join. Core Stage 3 is the last element of SLS hardware that needs to be completed for the Artemis 3 lunar landing mission. The hardware for the boosters, engines, second stage, and connectors are more or less ready to stack or begin final stacking preparations today. Although recent reports suggest that the lunar lander might not be ready until the end of 2028, NASA would need the next Orion and SLS builds to be complete in order to keep open any options to fly two Artemis missions in the next three years. Otherwise, there could be another three-year gap after Artemis II, just as there was after Artemis I. The pictures that were published on Avail show the latest in a series of breakovers for the liquid oxygen tank. It is transferred around MAF in Rotation, Assembly, and Transportation Tools, or RATS, and this is a tank rat that grips the LOX tank just inboard of the forward and aft flanges where the elements are bolted together. That area is treated with primer for corrosion, and the RATS are part of the automated system that applies spray-on foam insulation to almost all of the tank acreage and domes. But the foam spray in that strip is left until after the forward join. In these images taken on November 7th in the transfer aisle of Building 110, the rat rings are partially removed to allow the two heavy cranes to be connected to the tank for the breakover. At some point before these pictures were taken, the Core Stage 3 inner tank was installed in cell D in MAF's VAB, which is Building 110, also called the Vertical Assembly Building there. Here the tank is broken over or rotated to vertical, the trailing crane is detached, and the tank is lifted up into the cell, lowered down onto the inner tank, and then bolting that flange takes place. A couple of interesting things to note in close-ups is that we can see the attach points for the systems tunnel in a couple of images before and after the breakover. There are two sections of the system's tunnel that fit onto each propellant tank around the inner tank, and the base plates for those sections are secured with these bolts. During the breakover and lift, we can see one of the jobs that was completed in the time since we last saw the tank. The sump was installed in the bottom of the LOX tank in August, and since then that area was closed out with more spray-on foam. The two openings are where the LOX feed lines will connect to the tank. Several sections of the feed lines will then run from inside the inner tank, out along the length of the liquid hydrogen tank, and then into the engine section. 
The first S-duct sections will be installed inside the inner tank, while the forward joint assembly is vertical in cell D. That is one of the jobs that will be in work while the bolted assembly remains there. Bolting the flanges together physically integrates the three elements, but then they have to be functionally integrated, and that work starts while the forward joint is vertical in cell D. Once all that work is complete, the forward joint will itself be broken over to horizontal and rolled back over to the final assembly area of adjoining building 103. Functional integration will continue there, and at that point the so-called four-fifths of the stage will be down to two large sub-assemblies, the forward and aft joins. Those will then be joined at the appropriate time, with the bottom of the inner tank being bolted to the top of the LH2 tank. That will allow additional integration of the core stage functionality across the top four elements. And while that internal outfitting is going on, Boeing will also be installing external equipment. That includes the system's tunnel sections, the LOX feed lines that attach to the exterior of the LH2 tank, and repressurization lines that run from the engine section to the top of the propellant tanks. Eventually, the four fifths will be transported from MAF to the Kennedy Space Center, where it will be lifted up into Boeing's core stage vertical integration center tool in high bay 2 of the KSC vehicle assembly building, and then joined to the engine section, which is already there. The latest forecast, which goes back to the summertime, was that the final mate of the four fifths to the engine section at KSC would be in the spring, and that's something we're watching for. Before then, though, we'll be watching to see when the final mate in New Orleans occurs and when the four-fifths departs MAF on NASA's Pegasus barge. In a couple of those November 7th pictures, we can also see the LH2 tank for Core Stage 4 in the background in the Vertical Assembly Center welding tool. As Boeing noted in a recent update, welding of the tank in the tool was down to the final weld of the aft dome to the barrel. We can see that Boeing had configured the hardware for the operation and or it was in progress. Once that is complete, the tank can be moved out of the VAC, since there is a line of Artemis IV related hardware to get into it next. That includes the Exploration Upper Stage Structural Test Article LH2 tank and inner stage, the Core Stage 4 Liquid Oxygen tank, and the EUS Flight Article hardware for Artemis IV as well. The other SLS elements for the first Block 1B, the boosters and engines, are either already in storage or will be relatively soon, so the pacing items for the overall vehicle are the two Boeing stages, the Core Stage and EUS. The EUS also has new connectors, the inner stage connects the EUS with the Core Stage, and the Universal Stage Adapter houses a 10-ton class secondary payload in the connector with Orion. For the inaugural EUS flight, one set of qualification articles are being assembled into structural test articles, and then there's a second set of structures for the flight articles, which also have to be outfitted. The STA is a passive structure. The flight article is a working upper stage, where the SLS avionics will now be located, the flight computers and new flight software, the navigation unit, and the specialized upper stage avionics. It will also have a working main propulsion system and four RL-10 engines. The STA is being assembled at MAF for eventual shipment to the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville for a structural test campaign. That includes the structures for the two propellant tanks, the mid-body that connects them, the forward adapter, the thrust structure, and a simulator for the equipment shelf. Right now, the only STA element that needs its final welds is the EUS LH-2 tank. The flight article is following right behind the STA. For the most part, it still needs to be welded, assembled, and outfitted. In order to keep up with the official September 2028 launch date for Artemis IV, the flight article will need to complete the EUS Green Run test campaign by the end of 2027, if not a little sooner. That might seem far away, but it is only two years from now. The Artemis IV SLS hardware, which would be the first to fly in the Block 1B configuration, is officially targeted for a September 2028 launch. However, with the recent reports that the lunar lander might not be ready for Artemis III until around that end of 2028 timeframe, there's a bigger picture question for Artemis, which is whether or not any mission could be flown in 2027. 
Or maybe whether or not it is desirable to fly another mission after Artemis 2, but before the end of 2028 timeframe for a first lunar landing. In some ways, we can look at Artemis 3 and 4 the way that we've been looking at Artemis 2 and 3. If Artemis 2 can stay on its official April 2026 schedule, then it depends on what choices NASA makes about Artemis 3. If this next set of Orion and SLS hardware remains assigned to the first lunar landing mission, in other words, if NASA chooses to stay with their existing plans, except delayed from mid-2027 to late 2028 or 2029, then that has one set of implications for Artemis 4. Congress only provided NASA with the infrastructure to fly one SLS configuration at a time. So in that case where Artemis 3 flies in late 2028 or 2029, Artemis 4 has a lot of pre-launch testing for the first Block 1B configuration and won't be ready to fly until the beginning of the next decade. If NASA wants to maintain some operational tempo and try to fly a next mission in late 2027 or 2028, then it has a different set of implications for Artemis 4, including making that mission the first lunar landing mission for Artemis instead of the second. But flying the last SLS Block 1 vehicle would allow the SLS program and exploration ground systems to complete the transition to Block 1B and the new mobile launcher and fly Artemis 4 before the end of the decade. NASA may be exploring other options for HLS for Artemis 3, but we are still waiting for details. Starship remains the HLS lunar lander until we see and hear otherwise, and so we're keeping an eye on the NSF NASA spaceflight coverage of all the activities at Starbase in southern Texas. After the booster for the first flight of version 3 was destroyed in an accident early on the morning of November 21st, SpaceX quickly announced that the next build in line would be stacked by the end of December, so we'll be waiting for confirmation of that on NSF live streams. In the same social media post, SpaceX also notes that the first version 3 flight, number 12 overall, would be in the first quarter of next year, so by the end of March. There was one other news item during the holiday week. Airbus posted on social media that the fourth European service module was on its way from their Bremen, Germany production site to the Kennedy Space Center for integration with the Artemis IV Orion spacecraft. We never saw the completed ESM-4 unit at Bremen, so we'll have to wait and see whether any imagery of boxing the element appears in public. Once the ESM arrives in Florida, it will be taken to Lockheed Martin's Orion Integration Facility inside the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC. Eventually, it will be mated to the crew module adapter for Artemis IV once that is completed, and then farther down the road with a completed crew module. That Artemis IV Orion spacecraft was a part of the second planned lunar landing mission, which is also the first gateway assembly mission. Depending on what happens, perhaps as soon as this coming year, we could see some changed plans. But we still don't know what the schedule for the Artemis IV Orion build is, only that, like SLS, they were supposed to be ready before the official September 2028 target launch date. Thanks as always for watching. Like and subscribe if you find these videos informative and want to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. As usual, a big thanks to the members of this YouTube channel who are helping to make it possible to keep doing these videos. I'm posting more videos and making more frequent updates for members during the week if you're interested in joining. If you're willing to make a one-time donation to support what I do, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me a Coffee page in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.